It looks like it's six o'clock or seven o'clock um, on the East Coast, and then I think we're ready to start. Welcome to tonight's webinar, People Who Use AAC in Emergencies and Disasters, Tales from the Trenches. My name is Liz Begley, and I am your facilitator for this evening's webinar. Tonight's program is brought to you by the U.S. Society for AAC, or USAC, the voice of AAC. Thanks to the USAC Education Committee and to Isaac for making this possible. USAC is thrilled with the response to tonight's topic. We have a full house. We hope you will join USAC by going to www.usac.org slash membership. Our new membership year began January 1st, 2018. Early registration for our webinars is a member benefit. This is especially helpful when our webinars are very popular, like this one. Another member benefit is a substantial reduction in registration for the biannual Isaac Conference, this year held in Gold Coast, Australia. Go to www.isaac.org to learn more about this fabulous opportunity. Sarah, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, a disclosure, neither of our speakers have financial or non-financial relationships to disclose relevant to the content of the webinar, other than their membership in Isaac's, uh, USAC's Disaster Relief Committee. For logistics during this webinar, your microphone will be muted. You can ask questions by typing into the question box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. So you might want to look for that now. Questions will be answered as time allows in the last segment of the webinar. We may group together questions that are similar. We ask that you pose your questions in a general fashion rather than related to a specific individual. Questions that are not responded to during the webinar may be answered afterward via email. For continuing education, the ASHA CEU participation form and certificate of attendance can be found at www.isaac-online.org slash English slash news slash webinars. You must stay for the duration of the webinar in order to receive credit. And our webinar platforms let us see who is on and for how long. I doubt anyone will want to leave before the end, though, as it's such an important and timely topic. At the conclusion of tonight's webinar, registrants will receive a follow-up email that provides the link to the archive, CEU form and instructions, and an evaluation link. There is no charge to use at members for ASHA CEUs. CEUs are $25 for non-members. And Sarah, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. And it is now my very great privilege to introduce Amy Goldman and Sarah Blackstone, who are our speakers tonight. Amy has been involved in assistive technology, or AT, and emergency preparedness since Hurricane Katrina, when she led efforts to respond to the needs of people who lost AT as a result of that disaster. Amy is past chair of ASHA Special Interest Group 12, and a member of the National Joint Committee um, on the Communication Needs of Persons with Severe Disabilities. She is currently USAC's Vice President of Finance and serves on its Disaster Relief Committee. Sarah is USAC's past president and co-chair of its Disaster Relief Committee. She spearheaded USAC's efforts after Hurricane Katrina, works with first responders and emergency service workers founding Monterey County's Community Emergency Response Volunteers, a nonprofit organization in 2012. And she co-authored an insightful chapter on disaster preparedness, highlighting key issues impacting people with communication vulnerabilities. She serves on the National Institute of Health's Institute on Hearing and Communication Disabilities. I am so pleased to now turn the presentation over to Amy and Sarah. Thank you, Liz. So just a brief review of the learner objectives for tonight. 
we hope for uh, certain that you will walk away being able to answer these without uh, even a second thought. So you will learn about the challenges faced by people who use AAC. You will be able to generate three actions that people with disabilities can take in order to be prepared. And you will be able to identify resources for emergency related vocabulary and plenty of other resources for communicating during disaster or emergency. So next slide. So Craig Fugate, who is the past uh, FEMA administrator, said this. If you are waiting for a situation to develop, you're going to lose your ability to change the outcome. And in fact, preparedness is one of the key takeaways for tonight, the understanding the importance of being prepared. Who would have thought 2017 would have brought disaster after disaster from earthquake to flood to fire to wind? And 2018, unfortunately, is not looking too much better. So we've got to be prepared. Next slide. So it's not just Amy and Sarah suggesting that you be prepared. In fact, the codes of ethics of key professional associations make clear that holding primary the welfare of the people we serve is a key underpinning of our code of ethics. So you see ASHA says that uh, OT, I don't know how many OTs are on, but the American Association for Occupational Therapy talks about demonstrating a concern for well-being and safety. Next slide. The American Physical Therapy Association, meeting the health needs of people nationally, locally, globally, as a matter of fact. RESNA, the Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America, says we need to hold paramount the welfare of persons that were served. Special education professionals, as per the Council for Exceptional Children, Professionals are expected to engage in those activities that will benefit individuals. And let me tell you, if there is practically nothing as fundamental to assuring the health and safety of people with disabilities as to helping them become prepared and helping them recover. Next slide. But guess what? You cannot help others unless you are prepared. So uh, without taking the time to do a survey, I just ask you to reflect, are you prepared? What about your employer's plans? So what happens if there's an emergency or disaster when clients are on premises? Do you know what to do? How will you communicate with your colleagues and clients? What happens if your office is shut down for four weeks or four months, or like colleagues of mine in the US Virgin Islands, for eight months? How can you get to your records if you can't get into the office? If you're a private practitioner, you should have what's known as a COOP, a continuity of operations plan so that you can resume practice as soon as possible. And of course, our payers have requirements for how you must be prepared as well. Next slide. Hi, everybody. It's Sarah now. Uh, we're going to be taking some turns here. We want to tell you some tales from the trenches. And our first tale is actually a USAC story. The Disaster Relief Committee formed initially in response to Hurricane Katrina 
And in, 19, in 2017, we reactivated uh, just after Hurricane Harvey hit, soon to be followed by Irma Maria and then the fires in California. The USAC board engaged its members from each of these areas because you've got to have boots on the ground. Along the way, a USAC has assumed a role as a go-to or the go-to organization responsible for address, helping to address the needs of people who use AAC impacted by a national disaster. Over the mat months, many months, we have met and worked closely with individuals and multiple organizations and agencies, some of whom are pictured on the slide. Last month as well, Amy and Mara, our representative from Puerto Rico, participated in the Getting It Right conference in Washington, D.C. And Amy and I continue to participate on weekly national calls. And Liz is so active with the Red Cross in Texas. How did we do this? Well, we want to tell you about Recovers. It's a website portal available in both English and Spanish. The, com the committee, the USAC committee, who are all listed on the right, put up the Harvey AAC on, on the recovers.org website September 2nd, just a day or two after the storm. This portal enables USAC to provide a national response to a local disaster, working collaboratively with other organizations and agencies and nonprofits. We used, we used the recovers.org website in 2016 in the Monterey area in response to the wildflower, wildfires in our area and found it to be a powerful tool. A few weeks later, we had to launch another website, aacdisasterrelief.recovers.org. This allowed us to begin to respond to Irma Maria and the fires in California. This is the site we will continue to use as a go-to website in 2018 and beyond. Have a look at the site. As you can see, people impacted by a disaster can request help. I have a need. Others can offer to donate or volunteer. Our site focuses on meeting the needs of people who use AAC and have lost access to their communication tools and technologies. So here you see a screenshot of the Harvey AAC dashboard. It shows how us organizers manage the site and it makes it easy for us to communicate with people who are requesting help, donors, volunteers, as well as share information, collaborate with others, and maintain data over time. Note that in the Texas area, throughout the, this is really pretty much in the beginning, we received 113 needs and most have been met. We had 15 donors and 13 people who volunteered. And we also have posted and sent messages and shared resources and continue to do that. We responded to everyone who came on the site. This is though interesting. Of the people who rely on AAC and their families who came on the site, there were only 22. We communicated with these individuals and family members, their teachers, their speech pathologists, their OTs, partnering with the Red Cross, other AAC manufacturers to meet their needs. 55 of these individuals who came on the site asked for help that was not related in any way to them having a disability, and we referred all of them to other resources. And 26 requests came from people who had disabilities, were disability related, but were not uh, individuals that we were in a position to help. And we were able to make referrals to organizations and agencies uh, in the local area as well as nationally. In addition, there was an incredible outpouring of gifts, both financial 
and in kind from our communities. Now let's take a second here and consider again USAC's role, but looking at it from a 30,000 feet perspective um, and considering the disaster cycle. Individuals who rely on AAC and lose access to their communication tools and supports are at very, very high risk throughout the disaster cycle. Obviously, during a disaster and just after, with the immediate response from first responders, we soon enter a period called relief. Relief can last months, certainly lasts, um, and then recovery lasts, uh, often takes many years. A big problem is that when the focus of a news cycle for and, or the focus of FEMA and other organizations shifts, people often feel forgotten and as we've been learning in the news recently, sometimes are and were. USAC understands that as an organization and as professionals, as family members and individuals who use AAC, we really have an important role to play and should play throughout the disaster cycle. Another a tale from the trench, I'd like to introduce you to uh, a one, we call them our first family because they came on very early to the site, the Dravasos. Pre-disaster, Elena, the mom, her husband, two preteen children with autism and their new two-month-old infant were living in Katy, Texas. The incident, Harvey hit and they were their house was badly flooded response the family evacuated to a hotel in Dallas the damage to their home was extensive and both the children had lost their iPads on October 2nd which was really moving into the relief period Elena went on Harvey AAC recovery site and typed in two iPads for communication for my two children with severe autism. Liz and I talked with her multiple times as well as with a local speech language pathologist and we submitted a request to the Red Cross on October 15th for two iPads. Along the way we had learned that both children were homeschooled. The Red Cross approved the iPad replacements on October 17th, and Elena and the kids had them on the 19th. Liz then made sure the kids got the right iPads and the right cases, and this family, Elena, had accessed their apps, and they, she made it possible to access their apps because they were stored in the cloud. So recovery, their recovery process is ongoing. During the early parts, dad was driving to Katy so he could work on the house every week and then back to Dallas on weekends. The family had hoped to be home by Christmas, but that certainly didn't happen. After the iPads were set up, Elena wrote Liz, Alisa loves baking and we did a pumpkin pie last night because she really wanted it. She also noted that Andre loves car rides. When daddy got here this weekend, he wanted to ride the car with him a lot. So as we fast forward now, it's nine months later and their recovery is still ongoing. The emotional cost of spending almost eight months in a hotel, Elena pointed out, is enormous. This family is not going back to Katy. They've decided to relocate permanently in Dallas. Elena says, we just can't face another rain in Houston. So their lives were and continue to be disrupted, yet their story is one of persistence, resourcefulness, humor, grit, and amazing resilience, as is the stories of most of our families who are now also USAC members. 
Each story we hear was different and has unfolded in different ways along the disaster cycle. Sometimes it took us months to sort out recommendations for replacement devices, working with school districts and say, so on. For all the families of individuals who rely on AAC, we did find replacement technologies. And as I mentioned, they all now have a free membership in USAC. So we wanna keep learning our tales from the trenches. So we conducted a survey, we're kind of in the middle of it, um, of the people who we had been in touch with in the Houston area. The response rate is still low, but it's so it's just a glimpse. Um, note that the individuals we're serving represented across the age ran, range, and also they depended on multiple modes of communication. I think it's interesting to see um, how prevalent the use of tablets are, as well as, of course, always gestures and even manual signs. We also asked people whether they were prepared and did they have a plan before Harvey had hit. Nearly 90% said they were not prepared or only somewhat prepared before Harvey. In terms of their plan, more than half said they did not have a plan and most who did said their plan didn't work. So as Amy was saying, preparation uh, planning is so important. What about today? Who We asked who has a plan and these are the results. So as we know, before the hurricane, roughly 54% had no plan. Now, nine months after the hurricanes, surprisingly, 25% still have no plan. The good news, however, is that 75% indicated, indicated that either they have or are working on a plan. Interesting though, no one had practiced their plan. So what is our plan? We plan, as professionals and organization and agency to help clients plan. We should be taking a lead role, as I think Amy made very clear, um, in helping people come up with a plan, we have a key role to play. Amy, it's over to you. All righty. So this is just a screenshot of a tool that was developed uh, by the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. Uh, it's a pretty lengthy uh, document, but it is a fillable PDF to walk people through the development of a plan. Uh, and this is just one of the resources. FEMA also has resources to help people make a plan. Uh, and by the way, because this was uh, created with public funds, uh, you can take this plan and download it yourself. So next slide, please. So tips for people who use AAC and their families. And again, you can be thinking about when is a good time to talk about this with your clients? Keeping in mind that you may be the only professional having this conversation. You may be the only professional with whom your clients have an interaction like this. Uh, my guess is that not even their physicians are discussing this with them. So, you know, in a perfect world, I would say if you're working with transitioning students, uh, students from age 14 and up, you would be talking with them about preparedness as an adult responsibility. So anyway, if you are a family member and you're on the call, uh, or again, if you're working with family members, talk with them about making a plan for evacuating or staying. And it's interesting, there's a very specific set of vocabulary terms 
that may or may not be familiar to the people you're working with. They may not understand the term evacuating or sheltering in place. So even people without disabilities may be unfamiliar with these terms. So you want to talk to folks about how are you going to evacuate with all of the assistive technology and AAC that you need. What will you do if you cannot evacuate with those tools? How would you communicate? And then how would you go about replacing your devices? We'll talk a little bit more specifically later in the presentation. People should have a go kit, sometimes called a go bag. One for each person, one for a, each pet, by the way, and one in each environment. So again, uh, you know, people might say, oh, I have one at home. But we do know, thinking about in the Northeast winter storms, the emergency or disaster may occur while you're in your car. So again, people, family members need to be thinking, what will happen if your supports cannot get to you? So if you have a personal care attendant and it's uh, a winter storm and now the roads have been closed and maybe the governor has uh, or the mayor has shut down public transit, what are you going to do when your personal care cannot get to you and get out of bed, help you get out of bed? So this is a pictorial uh, representation, thanks to news to you of what might be in a go bag. Of course, there's going to be information, flashlight, uh, hopefully it's a, a battery operated weather radio that can give you alerts, uh, change of clothes, keeping in mind that you may be going somewhere uh, that does not provide you a change of clothes or by the way, a shower. Uh, you'll want to have water. If you have a service animal, you'll want to provide pet food uh, for your service animal. Medication, which can be the trickiest thing to keep in a go bag because uh, your insurance may not pay for you to have a backup supply, by the way. Uh, food, you don't want to have... Uh, anything that's uh, going to rot. So you're going to want to have canned food and make sure you have either a can opener or you have a canned food with a pull top. You're going to want to consider having a backup paper board as well as key information about yourself and uh, medical supplies. Next slide. So again, here's a checklist that people might use to begin thinking and planning. So does everyone on your team know what to do? What about your evacuation plan? And transportation can be a really significant issue for those who are in power chairs. Um, I know a colleague of mine who has uh, an adapted van, uh, unfortunately the floods hit and the van was in the shop. So what was the plan? What will you take with you? And if you are evacuating to a shelter, do you know what your rights are? We talked about the go bag and the laminated backup display that hopefully you have it at all times. Also, and again, we'll talk a little bit later about vocabulary for emergencies, but the words, messages you might need in a shelter or in communicating with first responders uh, may not be the typical uh, core or even fringe vocabulary. So next slide, please. Another form of a checklist, and again, uh, this is from the AAC, RERC, something for you to use as a tool to make sure that you are thinking about all these things and measuring your progress in terms of being prepared. Next slide. 
Uh, again, from the emergency readiness plan, uh, thinking about having important papers with you. What are you going to do with them? Where are you going to keep them? Uh, guess what? When Sandy hit, if you lived at the Jersey Shore, uh, even if you could get out, a fat chance that you would find an ATM that was working. So, and, and this is a challenge. You know, the best advice is to keep some cash in your go kit. Well, if you're a person with a disability who's also low income, uh, you're not going to have the luxury of keeping $100 in your go kit. If you think about the other things here, a copy of utility bill, it proves your address. Social security card, a photo ID, these are important things for identifying yourself, identifying your property that you may need when it comes time to register for assistance. I also just wanted to mention that not all disasters rise to the level of being a presidentially declared disaster or emergency. Um, so it doesn't mean that, oh, I don't have to worry about this. Your emergency readiness should be helping you get ready regardless of the scale of the disaster. Although I like to tell the story of a young woman with Down syndrome that we were helping think about emergency preparation. And, you know, we said to her, well, can you think of an example? of an emergency or disaster. And she paused and thought, and she said, if we run out of ice cream? So clearly, even understanding the concept of emergency or disaster may be difficult for some people. Next slide. So, whoops, <laughs> there we go. So again, People who use AAC in their families should be thinking about preparing their AAC and their assistive technology. So keep a compatible charger for each item in your go kit. Uh, we know uh, this may be more of an issue for dedicated SGDs than for tablets and phones, but if any of you have had the experience of recently upgrading, uh, you may have found that your um, manufacturer might have changed the plug on your device. So you want to keep a compatible charger for each item. Even as you go through the day when it's blue skies, Try to keep your devices as fully charged throughout the day as possible. Invest in a backup battery charger or a solar battery charger that'll work with your device and one that has enough storage that it would hold several charges. Keep it charged, not just when they say, oh, the hurricane is coming. Personalize your SGD with vocabulary that might be useful. Make sure you have a low-tech system and, you know, in some cases, the easiest way to do this is to have a hard copy printout of your display or at least an alphabet board. And if you can, when you upgrade your device, if that old device is at all working, keep it at a family member's home, a place that you might be going to if you evacuate and ask whoever is uh, keeping that for you to make sure it is kept uh, charged. Next slide. Okay, so now um, we're going to take the perspective of some of the people that have just been through Hurricane Harvey. We asked them, what resources were not available to you that would have helped? And it's always good to remember that even though we're focusing on communication, that the resources that are needed um, most quickly and most often um, relate to basic survival and comfort. So 
money for living expenses, temporary housing, access to transportation, and information was huge. Resources that they people, some people felt were not available to them. Um, also, replacement communication tools and other kinds of durable medical equipment was important, and some people did not have access. We also asked um, what specifically impacted individuals' ability to communicate um, afterwards, and they, in, this included not just the loss or damage of a tool, but lack of access to vocabulary and emotional issues, the anxiety that was related to disruption of routine or being in an unfamiliar environment or helpers who did not speak the same language as the individuals who were impacted or an individual's inability to understand spoken or written instructions of helpers. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration and, and as as an organization and as individuals who, who want to be helpful, we have to remember it's not just about tools and technologies. Let's look for a bit at vocabulary in a little bit more depth. Uh, USAC is uh, undergoing a project led by Liz and, and Tina uh, to find out more about what vocabulary is needed, but also to find ways to respond to these needs in a more efficient and uh, a more um, on, on, on call in a way. In the meantime, we suggest that in planning, we need to think more about the likely scenarios that are going to happen where we live or where you live, and also to make sure that we're involving individuals who are going to be using these in developing um, vocabulary and the icons that would, might be representing them. So we have some um, ideas to suggest before the disaster. Um, will the disaster reach us? Will we be safe? Things that people might want to ask, as Amy mentioned, the go bag. Um, and also things about feeling and what you might be feeling after an event or during an event, like scared, worried. In addition, let's remember that shelters are overwhelming to most people, but especially to individuals with disabilities, access and or functional needs. If we're unable to communicate in a shelter situation with, because you don't have a communication support system there, you don't have your tools there, and you're gonna need to be surrounded by strangers, things are unlikely to go very well. Some ideas for recovery. These should relate to reality. What happened before, during, and after the disaster? These kinds of vocabulary, this access to vocabulary can help in relieving stress, building resilience, and certainly help people get through the recovery process. Visual scene displays, because you can take photographs with a cell phone so easily, put it on a tablet and make a, a, a social story about it, personalizing the experience are probably one of the best strategies we might have. So as Amy said, back up your device in the cloud and um, Many of our families had done this, and certainly better to have disaster vocabulary and not need it than not to have it. And pictured here are some really two very great resources that you can download. And of course, these will be, the whole slide set's gonna be posted so you can get, a, get these very easily.
So this is a lot of information on one slide, but basically it we asked people after the few months, after a few months, what resources did you find most helpful? And here we see things related to planning in advance um, and then right after registering for assistance and being careful how you do that and contacting organizations for help. We've also talked about equipment, you know, having batteries, bringing your communication device with you, keeping devices and equipment charged. We need to also think about these many of these suggestions that people made that relate to the emotional stress and helping individuals deal with that, um, not just kids, but the adults as well. And these were some of the suggestions that um, the people that who responded to the survey uh, mentioned, you know, replacing favorite stuff, um, trying to stay within some kind of routine and talking about what's going on. So being able to communicate effectively is essential across the disaster cycle. And for people who rely on AAC, having access to tools and technologies and human supports is critical. And let's remember, it's not just about expressing wants and needs or about responding to other people's questions. Sure, we need to be able to ask questions, but we also need ways to engage, to participate, and to understand what's going on. So accessing emotional supports and making sure that people have a way to communicate authentically with their family members and, if possible, with strangers and with the other people, with people, the many people who might be trying to help them. We met individuals who did not speak English. Um, we met individuals who have very different life stories and perspectives and belief systems and cultural identities. However, and and this was actually a uh, an honor for us as individuals, professionals, and as representatives from organizations and agencies and the government trying to help, we need to be remember that effective communication is the joint establishment of meaning and that to be helpful requires that we strike and maintain a posture of cultural humility. So I put the definition of um, Communi effective communication and cultural humility on the slide because I think it speaks to the role we can play. Over to you, Amy. Okay, so again, another kind of unique terminology uh, in the emergency preparedness world is called access and functional needs. So that was a term that was coined to be, um, I think, more respectful than special needs populations, uh, little person first language, people with access and functional needs, which includes people with disabilities. It includes people who are pregnant. Uh, it includes people who are seniors who may or may not have a disability. So that's one of the key terms that you all should become familiar with, uh, because if there is a call for volunteers to participate in disaster drills, for example, particularly if the call is for people with access and functional needs, you'll know they're talking about you. So make a plan and practice the plan. Uh, you know, the firefighting, forest fire people did a really good job of helping people understand only you can prevent forest fires. Um, 
I think we've done a fairly good job when it comes to what happens if uh, your clothes get on fire, you all know, right? Drop and roll, uh, and you practice it. So the same thing for becoming disaster ready. Uh, you do want to participate in emergency planning efforts in your community. So um, emergency professionals have disaster drills. It's much better if they are practicing with people who truly have disabilities rather than with somebody who's pretending. A colleague of mine who has a spinal cord injury said, you know, it's a lot different to try to lift somebody who's pretending to be paralyzed, whereas a person who's really paralyzed is dead weight. Join a VOAD. A VOAD is a voluntary organization active in disaster. Google it for your municip municipality. Uh, so many communities have registries, so if you are a person with access and functional needs, you can register. However, people think that sometimes, oh, I've signed up for the registry, that means they're coming for me first. It does not work that way. It just helps the first responders and emergency personnel know who and where you are. It does not mean you'll get priority treatment. Sign up for emergency alerts so that they you can get a text, for example. Of, you know, especially since nowadays people are more likely to be on their phone than on the uh, thing we used to call a radio. Uh, again, understand terminology like storm warning versus storm watch just part of how you can get prepared. Next slide, please. And providers can be part of the solution too. Make a plan and practice the plan. Be a part of emergency planning efforts in your community. Um, in September, USAC had a great webinar from Mankey and Rang, and the um, archive link is listed there on a training that they do to train first responders and emergency personnel about how to communicate with people with limited speech. You can join a VOAD and of course provide the users that you're working with with appropriate vocabulary and terminology and uh, one of the ways to help prepare particularly people with autism but really anyone who's going to be anxious when there's the kind of disruption that comes along with emergency or disaster. Create and share social stories. Next slide. So I'm just going to highlight a few of these. Uh, ultimately, they will all live on USAC's website, but we are currently uh, updating the website. And uh, one of these months, you'll see that there's an overhaul. Uh, the ready.gov is a federal resource for helping people uh, get ready with uh, has lots of downloadable brochures and tips and you'll see here that terminology access and functional needs they have an interesting uh, planner document for if you're a commuter what's your emergency plan there are some shareable videos and information about how, your, how you can develop your family communication plan and identify a meeting place in the event of an emergency. There are several great resources here from Carol Zangari and the Practical AAC blog. So uh, the first one has tips for AAC users and plenty of links to more boards and social stories that are helpful for kids with autism. Um, they recently um, have this uh, practical resources regarding um, lockdowns. Again, that's unfamiliar terminology. It's not a national disaster skill, 
but certainly something in this day and age, you know, people are seeing it, unfortunately, all too often on the news. So there's some great resources there, including a lockdown schedule and a social story and a worksheet on things you should or should not do. Disabilities.temple.edu website has downloadable communication boards in English and in Spanish and an alphabet board as well. Um, so it's often helpful to keep some of those uh, available. Uh, people who use AAC could keep them um, in their Go kit, uh, download it, and by the way, helpful to laminate it or put it in a plastic sleeve and seal it. Again, practical AAC, uh, this storm preparation and recovery has storm vocabulary, uh, what is a hurricane, tornado, and a bunch of board maker resources that you uh, need board maker in order to use them. Patient provider communications got a whole bunch of stuff, including uh, wonderful uh, first person narratives from Pam Kennedy. So take the time to explore those resources and I'm sure you'll find them of value. So I think I'm going to cue Liz to see if we had any questions come in. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah and Amy, for this incredibly eye-opening um, presentation. So I suspect many of you are wanting to rush off and gather things for your own go bag, but luckily we do have time for some questions and some have already come in during the presentation. So the first one is from um, Angela Standridge in Texas. Is the AAC relief site connected to the Amazon Smile donation site? If people choose to link their account to your nonprofit, Amazon makes a donation every time they shop. And um, I'm just going to answer this one if that's okay with you too. Angela, that's a fabulous idea. Uh, the, the recovery site is not linked to Amazon Smile. Um, but Sarah, do you think we could make that happen? I don't. Oh, actually. probably. <laughs> because, I, because the recovers.org website is used all over the world. And um, so that the, I, I'll, I'll check with the, um, the CEO there, okay. but uh, I'm not sure that it can be specifically linked to Amazon. I think it can be linked to or an organization that's on the website, but I I don't know about Amazon. Good question, Angela. Yeah, yeah, we'll and, look into it. Yeah, and this this is oh, Amy. I, I did want to mention that uh, USAC is among the nonprofits that are listed on Smile. Hmm. So uh, we we do benefit from that if you make your Amazon purchases uh, through the Amazon Smile. Okay, thank you for that, Amy. So the next question um, is from Kathy Howery. Who is paying for your time developing and analyzing the surveys, et cetera? Is that funded by you, Zach? Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, 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 let, let, let's be really, the full disclosure, um, USAC has no paid employees. Um, nothing we do is funded. And um, I, yeah, I think we, we do it because we think it needs to be done. And we are welcoming anybody else who thinks that way. <laughs> yes, there are plenty of volunteer uh, opportunities both on the Disaster Relief Committee and on our myriad of other committees. Okay, thank you for that. And Kathy also has a comment. Uh, look at that, anxiety. And I'm not sure, Kathy, if you're referring to uh, the fact that people going through a disaster need some anxiety vocabulary or um, what that comment actually means. So if you want to expand on that, that would be great. And um, now I have another uh, question from Angela. 
As a practitioner in Houston, I also intend to eventually connect with our city's Committee on Disabilities to ensure there are supports built into the response phase, especially first responders and shelters. So, so th this is Amy. So uh, Houston has a, a mayor's committee on people with disabilities who is staffed by a wonderful woman who's been integrally involved. She's a person with a disability herself, Maria Town. And she has been a driving force in hoping to make change uh, within that community. So if you want an electronic uh, introduction to her, I'm happy to do that. You just need to shoot me an email to remind me. Okay, thanks, Amy. And the next question is from Tina Caswell in New York. Is there a way to get our local Red Cross on board? How did you pursue their support? This is Sarah. I'll, um, I, I don't. I don't think it's been a problem. Um, I think it's a matter of reaching out and talking to them and forming a relationship, hopefully with the uh, CEO of the Red Cross in your area, or however they divide that up. Um, the Red Cross nationally is is very interested in um, doing a better job with people who have disabilities access and functional needs. And um, I think they have several initiatives ongoing and to have a disability integration specialist actually um, located in most areas. So uh, I think that there's a top-down push from the Red Cross and if they get some bottoms up, as in us, people like us, um, from to, to say we want to work together and here's what we're interested in and we'll help you do what you're interested in, that it's a good partnership. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And um, let's see, Angela did want to comment that the mayor's committee is what she meant and that many shelters in Houston had no support, um, which I, I think we have also found that to be the case. Yeah, so and I think the Red Cross also noted that um, in Houston and tried to do some things to correct that, but, um, and, and are continuing to work on that at a national level so that it filters down. Yeah, so this is Amy. I just wanted to add that um, shelters are not pleasant places to be in. And so if you ever hear talk uh, or rumbling that there may be an evacuation that is called for, evacuate so that you can choose where you're going. Uh, and where you're going should be part of your planning as well. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and this is from Millie Matthew in Minnesota. That has a very nice ring to it, Millie. Um, how can one initiate workshops or training for disaster relief personnel? Um, that, this is Sarah. I, I think that um, hopefully, well, even if you haven't joined you, Zach, um, we have materials that we have created, will create, and I'm pretty sure that I speak for everybody that I know that whatever we have, we're willing to share and support any efforts in any place um, to do from the bottoms up and um, and support and, and reach out to first responders. We've found that in the Monterey area, that it's been easy to reach out to first responders and have developed all kinds of, of uh, ideas in how to do that and the response has been very good. I think one thing we have to remember is that the time a first responder spends with somebody in a disaster is very, very short. And that we shouldn't just think of disasters. The time that first responders spend with people who have emergencies is in our fire department, 70% of what they do is responding to emergencies. So everything we said about disasters 
make sense for emergencies, which happen every day, whereas disasters don't. Okay. Thank you, Sarah and Amy. We are out of time. I just want to thank all of you for participating this evening. I think we'll agree this was incredibly informative. And, you know, I hope that you consider forwarding this webinar to some of your colleagues so you can have a conversation about the information presented tonight. Please complete the evaluation that you will receive. And we are especially interested in your suggestions for future topics. And Amy, I know, hopes to see many of you in Australia. Oops, yeah, next slide, sorry. In Australia at the IVAC convention in July. We all urge you to join USAC to make sure you get inside the inside scoop on AAC in the United States. And part of that membership is um, also goes to Isaac. And I just want to hand it over for a, a farewell to Franklin, who is the president of Isaac and our tech guru. So Franklin, would you like to say a word before we end? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, a big thank you to everyone for being in attendance uh, this evening. It's great to see so many people online. Um, Liz, thank you so much for elevating me to such lofty heights. I'll downgrade myself a little bit. I'm only the executive director of Isaac, but I'm uh, I'm privileged to be uh, to be that. And um, I'll just send a big message out to everyone that if you've been sitting on the fence about coming to our conference on Gold Coast Australia this coming July, it's time to get off the fence. We've absolutely blown the doors off of our registration numbers. It's going to be a fabulous conference. We've got people from 40 countries around the world. So please make the decision and come out. It's going to be a trip of a lifetime and it's going to be an amazing conference with some amazing content and a fabulous program and everyone around the world is working hard to make it a huge success. So um, thank you, Liz. Of course, a big thank you to Sarah and Amy for tonight's presentation. And Liz, I'll let you have the last word. Oh, well, good night, everybody. And we look forward to joining you, Zach. Goodbye. <laughs>